Asia's coasts are the frontier between two great rivals. Land and sea constantly test each other's borders along 200,000 kilometers of Asia's shoreline. In the tropics, equatorial sun magnifies the power of earth and ocean to nurture an extraordinary profusion of life. There are sea creatures here who cling to the coast throughout their lives. Others are ocean travelers who return to the coasts only to breed and support their young. Half the world away, the seas of Asia's far north freeze during long months of winter and lock their shores in brutal cold. But when summer sun drives back the ice, these bare coasts will thrive with life. Land animals rely on the shoreline too. Through countless generations, they've survived on its rich seasons. Asia's fertile coasts harvest the endless bargaining of land and sea. And their own vital power reaches far inland and out into the ocean. Monsoon clouds over the Indian mountain lands are part of the great cycle of exchange between land and sea. Heavy with moisture swept up from the ocean, they burst, beginning a chain reaction which will reach the distant coast. For the land animals, it's a time of renewal. Rich growth promises survivors of long, dry months that they'll see out a new season. People have been starved of water too. Usually the downpour's a blessing and time for celebration. Torrents of water laden with rich sediment will prepare their land for crops. But at sea level, the water's blessing can turn into a curse. When high rivers collide with high tides, disastrous floods spill across vast areas of coastal plains. Every drop of rain plunders the land. But rivers that carry off the spoils must pass through forests, spread like great nets along the coast, waiting to steal the earth back again. Mangrove forests turn raw sediment to energy. And from India to Indonesia, they shield their soft and muddy coasts against the forces of the ocean. Plants and animals have been evolving in these forests for 65 million years. They still shelter and sustain a vast community of creatures. Saltwater crocodiles are ancient users of the mangroves. Long ago, these members of the crocodile family adapted to hunt the fertile waters between land and sea. High tide brings other predators from the ocean. Sea snakes hunting for goby fish and stingrays which dredge the mud for crustaceans. Mangroves are such a rich hunting ground because they're a nursery for so many land and sea creatures. This female's raising her young in these sheltered waters. At nearly a month old, they're confident enough to venture freely amongst the mangrove roots. They haven't eaten since hatching, but when they're hungry, they'll hunt their first meal in the mangroves. Their mother's lurking not far away, discreetly checking out intruders.
the pork pie crab's heavy armor would have done him little good if he'd been just a bit slower and she a bit closer. But he gets the chance to sidle back to safety while she continues her patrol. Tall mangroves are safe overnight roosts for Borneo's proboscis monkey. In the mornings, they're launching pads for sociable climbers. Many other monkeys visit Asian mangroves, but few depend on them as much as proboscis. They house a powerful digestion inside their roomy stomachs, so they can feed heavily on salty, tough mangrove leaves. But as coastal forests have dwindled, many groups now rely on remnant mangroves, where even proboscis find the pickings lean. The senior male on sentry duty is anxious. Careless visitors to the water's edge are moving into danger. His alarm call alerts the troop. A hidden crocodile is even more dangerous. and the panic sends one monkey right into the jaws of danger. But the crocs missed her opportunity. The rest of the troop takes a more cautious route back to the swamp forest. Like the crocodile, the trees have evolved to cope with this salty world. The mud they grow on is rich, but it's starved of oxygen, and the constant floods of seawater would poison most other plants. What looks like drowned debris is the forest's answer to its problem. These are the roots and lungs of living trees. As soon as the tide falls, they begin to harvest oxygen through special breathing cells in their exposed roots. And somehow, tender young plants are able to gain a foothold in this shifting, salty world. Each mangrove species has a way of giving its young a better chance of surviving. Some get a head start by beginning to grow while still attached to their parent tree. The long spears hanging down are immature mangroves, which are only planted when they're strong enough to survive the salty water. A lucky fall can plant a new seedling, but natural buoyancy and strong tides carry others far away, perhaps to found a new forest. The trees send more than their newborn to the ocean. They use sunlight and air to convert the nutrients of raw sediment into growth. The forest's like an immense storage battery, with every leaf an individual cell. Each leaf that falls begins to release new energy to the water. As the tide flows out of the mangrove, it carries off a rich stew of rotting organic material. Mangrove roots that spike the foreshore trap debris from the ocean too. As mangrove animals pick at this flotsam, they make their own contribution to the richness of the shoreline. Monitor lizards make regular patrols, searching for carrion delivered by the falling tide.
At low tide, a huge community of creatures emerges to feed on the mud. Fiddler crabs pack the best part of their lives into the time between the tides. Females feed at frantic speed. Hungry males are hampered by the super claw they use for defense and display. The low slack tide provides quiet water and a gentle ramp for the young crocs to crawl ashore. But they're still supervised by a watchful mother. As they venture from the water, the young crocs are feeling hunger for the first time and the mud is crawling with potential meals. This female fiddler crab could become an unwilling player in a young croc's graduation from infant to hunter. First the youngster stalks, then, even out of the water, uses classic croc ambush technique. Once in a good strike position, he freezes. The head shake to tear the prey apart is all croc instinct. One day he'll do it to pigs and monkeys. But now he heads for shelter to avoid other foragers in the mangrove. Troops of long-tailed macaques know where in their territory to find a meal and at low tide delivers good pickings. They're such frequent foragers here that they're also called crab-eating macaques. It's said they use their tails to lure crabs from their burrows. But they're more likely to dig vigorously to reach a meal, which might be animal, but could also be stranded nuts or fruits. The sea's lowest ebb reveals the tidal zone. Neither earth nor ocean entirely rules these sand flats, or the muddy world which christened the mud skipper. Perhaps the fishes which first crawled out of the ancient seas looked a bit like this. They're creatures of two worlds, fish which emerge from burrows to feed in the air. They graze the film of algae that clings to the surface of the mud. But these fish out of water have to breathe like fish. So every few minutes they return to tide pools to replenish their gill pouches with new supplies of water. His burrow is the center of a male mud skipper's world. This one could be mining a network of tunnels as much as five meters long. The burrows of mud skippers and other tunnelers play a vital part in taking air and water down into the suffocating mud which has been dumped from the land. As soon as the skippers emerge onto their muddy landscape, they stake their territory and they proclaim it by raising their flags. Warning, gaping mouth may be enough to drive off an intruder. If not, there's a full-scale joust to the ancient rules of mouth fighting. Victory usually goes to the mud skipper energetic enough to keep up the ferocious display.
As the returning tide starts to shrink the landscape, the skippers crowd onto the diminishing islands of mud. They're running out of time to do all the things that mud skippers have to do between the tides. Feed, maintain the burrow, display and defend the territory, perhaps even find a mate. Some are still trying frantically to complete their task list as the tide closes over them. Young seedlings have made good use of the low tide too, to grow stronger and tighten their hold on their slippery foundations. As they mature, mangrove forests become great allies of the land, colonizing more and more of its muddy coast as it slowly pushes out its border with the sea. The hard coasts of Indonesia are raised by a more dynamic force. Towering volcanic islands are stepping stones along a Pacific ring of fire, marking the battleground between two great geological plates. The land and the seabed are constantly twisted and breached as the earth struggles against itself. At any moment, these beaded curtains of gas escaping from the sea floor could be torn apart by titanic volcanic forces. Devastating eruptions on the surface leave their debris underwater. Life must struggle out through suffocating blankets of volcanic sand. The problem of surviving here often inspires bizarre solutions. The Feathermouth Sea Cucumber harvests sand like an industrial mining machine, while shrimps hitch a lift and turn over the tailings. The shrimps have a safe host. Most sea cucumbers are unpalatable to predators. It extracts food from the sand, passing the leftovers straight through. Fast-moving predators pursue food wherever they like. But on the exposed sea floor, many creatures use different strategies to hunt and to escape being hunted. The hunchback scorpionfish behaves like a self-propelled rock with a painfully slow top speed. But it's got a mouth like a mine shaft to engulf unweary prey. By comparison, the Pegasus Seamoth's version of the mobile rock is supercharged. They vacuum up prey as they patrol the sea floor. There's probably a point to this game of follow the leader. As the fish in front stirs up the bottom, there's more food for the follower to harvest. They look like a genetic engineer's nightmare but they're miracles of design compared to the devil fish. His disguise of a weed-covered rock deceives hunters, but seems to impede his own hunting. His quarry could be this cryptically striped hawkfish but the hawkfish is hunting too. Just beyond devilfish reach, he waits for prey disturbed by his clumsy pursuer. There's food arriving here all the time, a rain of organic debris washed from the nearby land. As each leaf breaks down, it releases energy to the ocean's creatures. But before their decay is complete, some of these earthly spoils will find another 
extraordinary use. Ghost pipefish don't just imitate the form and color of leaves. They mimic the dance of leaves stirred by gentle currents. They're so confident in their camouflage and choreography that they leave the original behind to dance their own way across the sea floor. gathering debris becomes a wardrobe full of disguises. But cockatoo waspfish aren't dancers. Their design almost traps them between dimensions as they flounder along beside a sheltering leaf. They've chosen a right colored leaf for disguise, but between two cockatoo waspfish it becomes a kind of territory, which they seem to dispute with feeble headbutts. The sea constantly tries to tear down these new volcanic shores. But in tropical oceans, the waves are competing with a builder who constantly renews the coastal ramparts. Wherever the slightest eddy offers a toehold, coral begins to build. At first, these might be only pioneer settlements, isolated life support systems for small communities. But from these outposts, coral sends more colonists into the warm tropical currents. Each coral has a spawning time, precisely triggered by phases of the moon, day length and water temperature, when it releases millions of eggs. Although only a tiny number will survive, each fertilized egg has the potential to lay a new foundation or provide a spectacular addition to an existing reef. As they're released, the eggs float upwards to be carried along by surface currents. Some species may drift for two or three months before reaching a place to settle and then build. And once it's established, each coral polyp can produce crowds of identical copies of itself. Coral can build a coast where none existed before. As countless generations of corals die, their skeletons become the massive foundations of living reefs. These architectural feats are powered by an extraordinary advantage that coral has over other animals. It's a plant as well. Inside each polyp are tiny vegetable cells which, like plants, use photosynthesis to feed on sunlight. The plentiful light of the equatorial tropics provides the energy for coral to build its sun palaces. As reef building corals claim more and more of the seabed, they create thriving oases of life. Indonesia's coral coasts feed and shelter the greatest variety of marine life on the planet. In the oldest warm ocean on Earth, these creatures have spent uncountable generations evolving their form and way of life. And every animal that lives here increases the reef's power to sustain more life.
but each new generation that crowds onto the reef faces a new test of its survival skills. Sea snakes like this banded crate specialize in hunting goby fish that hide in burrows. Sometimes it's someone else's home, but because they're extremely venomous, sea snakes can take a very direct approach to foraging. But when a cuttlefish hunts, it uses the subtlety and skill of a higher being, with sharp eyes and a highly developed sensitive nervous system. By triggering pigment cells in its skin, it can change color instantly. The rippling patterns disguise it from predators and from its prey. Propelled by water jetted through its body, it hovers over the reef like a psychedelic airship. As it gets closer to its prey, its strobing increases, helping it blend with the movement and dappled light around it. Many of the smallest reef animals aren't highly skilled hunters, and they're not strong or mobile. Instead, they use their neighbors and ingenious strategies of deception. The feather star is an animal imitating a plant, and beside it, an ornate ghost pipefish fanning his eggs is safely camouflaged as a feather star. Everywhere on the reef, species are forced to live on top of each other, just to have a place to grow and breed. One of the most extraordinary relationships is between the Gorgonian sea fan, a coral, and its tiny tenants. Pygmy seahorses are barely the width of a fingernail. They haven't only matched their color to their chosen home, they've also modeled their bodies in the shape of its bumpy polyps. The seahorses, a host of other microscopic creatures, and the sea fan itself are all feeding on particles netted from the nutrient-rich tide. The fan, less than a meter wide, is all the seahorses need to sustain themselves and to breed a new generation. The overweight seahorse in front is pregnant. But even these tiny creatures use tiny headbutts to defend their corner of their small world. Reef creatures which range more widely have to be just as ingenious to find their own kind and breed successfully. Bright colors are little help to nudibranchs in advertising to each other but they warn predators of an unpalatable or poisonous meal. When they're ready to breed, nudibranchs use the rather haphazard technique of finding and following each other's scented slime trails. But at the end of the search, they're guaranteed a mate of the right sex, because they're hermaphrodites. Each animal is both male and female. As soon as they're close enough, they mate by exchanging their packages of sperm. A 
A male mandarin fish doesn't go looking for a mate. First, he stakes out his territory by driving off a competing male. But his opponent's persistent and tries to invade again. This time he'll make sure the trespassers left the property before resuming his own display. Along the path of history, the secretive mandarin fish, distant relatives of the mud skipper, were handed a ration of sheer beauty. He's managed to attract two females from their shelter under the reef, but has no difficulty in deciding his partner. The loser makes a jealous attempt to break the couple up. But they mate, releasing the drifting seeds of a new generation. Asia's coral reefs give their inhabitants all that they need. Even the reef's stony fabric is food. Bumphead parrotfish fuel their bulky frames by biting off coral and algae, pulverizing it with their beak-like jaws. More than a meter long and weighing nearly 50 kilos, they move in schools across the reefs, trailing the sandy debris of their meal behind them. Where they climb up from the deep ocean, reefs trigger even more spectacular displays of life. Food-rich currents funnel up the reef walls and explode into the sun-warmed coastal waters. It's solar energy, which for 200 million years has helped coral to build its coasts and sustain their extraordinary community of life. It's so bountiful of fuel that these jellyfish have been able to shed their stinging and hunting equipment to become part plants. Like coral, they use photosynthesis to harness the power of sunlight. The sun, which gifts such abundance to the tropical coasts, has a far shorter reign in Asia's far north. Through the winter, brutal cold locks vast areas of ocean under ice. Only at the edge of the ice can coastal creatures make a living. Stellar sea eagles are driven nearly 2,000 kilometers from their home shores. Here on the northern coast of Japan, at the limits of the frozen sea, they can find enough food to last until the spring. Only when the sun begins to drive back the frontier of ice do they begin their journey north to breed on the coasts of the Russian Far East. For seven months, these subarctic coasts of Asia have been in hibernation, silent and barren. 
but as the ice starts to thaw, hundreds of thousands of birds begin to arrive, anticipating a rich season. Like the sea eagles, they've spent the winter at the edge of the ice and return here to breed. These are just the first arrivals of the vast community which will crowd onto the cliffs to raise their young during the brief Russian summer. As the ice melts away, it unlocks a great larder of plenty. These waters can't match the spectacular variety of the tropical reefs, but they're still extraordinarily fertile. And as light reaches down, it fires marine life into a burst of concentrated growth. Groups of Stella's sea lions come to hunt the fertile seas and breed their young on the coasts. Their foraging grounds are close to the shore, and because they're highly social animals, the sea lions spend a lot of their time just hanging out and playing in the shallow offshore waters. Their favorite haul-out points are on rocky offshore islands and isolated peninsulas. Adults and youngsters gather on these temporary homes. Younger males get the chance to spar with their elders, practicing skills they'll need to claim mates once they're old enough to breed. The stellar sea eagles also have favorite sites to which they return each year. Some breed in land, but eagles which have nest sites on the coast have a choice of hunting grounds. They can take fish for their chicks from the ocean and river estuaries, or they can hunt the densely populated seabird colonies, where the numbers grow to millions. The eagles put great store in the natural security of their nest site. During foraging expeditions, they can be away for as long as 20 hours. The transition to this abundance is remarkable. But soon, other visitors will arrive in even greater numbers. Every year, they bring a gift from the deep ocean, which is eagerly awaited by the creatures of the land. Vast numbers of pink salmon are preparing to travel upriver to breed. But before beginning their journey, they'll undergo a striking transformation triggered by the fresh water. The female skin will turn green, the males to pink or brown. And the males grow a hooked jaw and the imposing dorsal hump, which gives their other name, humpback salmon. Each male will use these tools to assert his own breeding quality to the swarming mass of fish. For brown bears who fasted during the long winter months, the salmon are a huge opportunity to stock up. This young male, about five years old, spends hours every day plunging through the salmon shoals in a mixture of hunting and playing. He's got a variety of techniques. First, he snorkels to find the concentrations of fish, then tries to sneak up on them. Often as not, he misses, but he does catch as many as 20 fish an hour.
He can't help but be successful. The salmon are easy prey while they wait here for their bodies to adjust to fresh water. And once they begin their journey inland, they'll meet more bears eager for a catch. A mother with cubs has to be cautious during fishing visits to the river. She must always be ready to move them to safety. The greatest danger is that they'll come across a large male foraging along the river. This one has a fairly relaxed attitude to territory and usually avoids disputes with other males. They'd both be badly hurt in a fight. But if cubs cross his path, there's a good chance that he'll kill and eat them, and perhaps kill their mother as well. But when danger's near, the safest place is close to mother. Meanwhile, the young male's making the most of his opportunities. As he gets more successful, he takes to eating only his favorite part of the salmon, the brains, the eggs of females, or the skin. But however many he eats, there are still countless survivors ready to begin the hard journey inland. The river is riddled with obstacles. Shallow water challenges all the salmon, but especially the males. Their huge humps are good for display, but in the rapids they're a burden. As they power against the current, the males burn huge amounts of energy. They stopped eating when they entered the river, and every obstacle saps reserves that will never be restored. So after each struggle, they rest when they reach quiet water. The journey's taking its toll. Wounds fester. Aggressive growths invade their skin and eat them alive. Small river fish stand by to feed on casualties. Later, they'll even steal eggs once the salmon begin mating. The salmon have a long way to go, though. The breeding ground for this group is nearly a hundred kilometers from the coast. The sea eagles follow the salmon upriver, too. But while they're away from the nest, there's another struggle going on. One of the chicks is already much stronger than the other, and it spends hours repeatedly harassing its weaker rival. The adults will soon have only one mouth to feed. Even the parents' return to the nest isn't enough to halt the campaign of destruction. By disabling his competitor, he's doubled his chances of flying. As the main river divides into tributaries, each salmon follows the scent of the stream bed where it was born. In the narrower and steeper waterways, the casualty rate begins to climb. There's an obstacle ahead, and as more and more fish press into the stream, the oxygen level in the water drops. First they begin to tire, then to suffocate. Only the strong and the lucky will battle their way over the final barrier to the breeding grounds. Mm -hmm. 
Each female chooses a site for her nest. By flapping her tail to lift the gravel, she creates a hollow in the riverbed. Males are attracted and begin to circle and compete. Only the strongest have survived the journey. Males displaying the most impressive humps will be favored as mates. Their fiercely hooked jaws drive the message home to less well-endowed rivals. As she nestles onto the riverbed and prepares to lay, males close in and vibrate their bodies to encourage her. Eager for a meal of eggs, the river fish join in. As the female begins laying, males crowd onto the nest and angrily challenge each other for the right to fertilize her eggs. Every nesting female provokes the same fierce drama played out countless times in hundreds of stream beds. And at every stage of their journey from the coast, the salmon have left a harvest for others to gather. There's been abundant food to be carried back to hungry youngsters waiting in the seabird colonies. And now they're growing strong enough to begin their own journey. By the end of the salmon run, the bears are glutted. In a bumper season, the young bears put on a good store of fat to carry him through the winter. Even if the river still teemed with fish, he probably wouldn't bother to chase them. As part of his preparation for winter, he'll soon be a vegetarian, feeding on berries and nuts. It's time for him to leave the coast and find a safe den to shelter him from freezing temperatures. But next year he'll come down from the mountains again to his favorite fishing spot on the coast. At the sea eagle nest, the survivor tries his wings. Soon he'll fly freely and be able to forage for himself. When he does, he'll find a huge supply of food to strengthen him before winter drives him from this coast. For the humpbacks, though, it's the end of their journey. The struggle from the coast demands too much. After spawning, they end their lives in the same streams where they were born. But as a legacy, they leave thousands of tons of food, energy from the ocean, which will feed the rivers for many months. They'll freeze in winter's ice, but the next spring will free their gift again and renew the timeless bargain between land and sea. <laughs>